Okay, a very good morning to one and all. Uh, usually, we will have one of our deacons to come and do the opening call to worship. Uh, I know probably still half the church is not here yet. Um, so, uh, I don't know, some of them are still slowly coming in. So, we will let them come on in uh, as we start. But uh, let's um, move to the next slide. Uh, do we have a slide of, uh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure whether many of you actually know Ron Hamilton, <coughs> Patch the Pirate. Our church really owe a great debt of gratitude to him uh, because for many years we have been using his music. One of my friends call his music, the soundtrack of her childhood. And even as I remember growing up, and our church did so much of his music, uh, I would re heartily agree that uh, his music really was the soundtrack of my childhood growing up. When our church first started the choir in, the, uh, in 1990, that was when we first started our church choir. Uh, in those early years, we sang a lot of the arrangements by Ron and Shirley Hamilton, uh, together with uh, Ron's father-in-law, Frank Garlock, uh, and his wife, uh, Flora Jean. In fact, uh, Frank Garlock was in our church. I remember the year 2000, he was here. So Frank Garlock was Ron Hamilton's uh, father-in-law who actually passed away a couple of months ago. So Shirley actually lost both her father and her husband in pretty quick succession. If you can remember Shirley Hamilton in prayer, I'm sure she would appreciate it. Um, the Lord has brought the Hamiltons through many trials. In 1978, when Ron Hamilton, at a young age of 27, um, was going for a routine check to get a pair of glasses, uh, uh, the doctor was concerned that there was something in his eye, maybe a blood clot in the eye, uh, or um, you know, uh, maybe it was just a speck, maybe nothing uh, to be concerned about, but uh, he ordered some tests for Ron to be done, Eventually, the doctor found cancer in his eye. And um, he woke up the next morning without his uh, left eye. And the following week, he went to church, and um, a kid came up to him and said, what's the patch on your eye? And uh, he mentioned to this kid, he says, well, I have this patch on my eye because uh, I'm Patch the Pirate. He's always wanted a dangerous sounding name, and uh, well, he got one. And from then on, he was known as Patch the Pirate, and the Lord has given him many, many years of ministry through music as he produced recordings uh, with a lot of these adventure teaching character, and now, you know, all, all these adventure can be live streamed on Spotify and all that, used to be on cassette uh, and, and CD. Um, and then the year 2013, Ron and Shirley Hamilton lost their son, Jonathan, who committed suicide. He struggled for many years uh, with mental illness. And um, he went to downtown Greenville to a parking garage and he took his own life. The Lord has brought the Hamiltons through many trials, and five years ago, the doctors diagnosed him with uh, dementia, and he gradually went downhill, and eventually passing on Wednesday night, which is our Thursday morning. So, but through it all, the theme of his life really can be summarized in the song that he wrote after he, after he lost his eye in 1978, which is... Rejoice in the Lord, which we will sing later on as well. And this man's life really is a life of 
focusing on the Lord regarding, re- regardless of the trials and the suffering the Lord has brought him through. And through his life testimony, he has blessed many, many, I would say tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people whose lives have been impacted uh, by his music. And uh, so today's music really will be um, uh, all of his work. Uh, and he points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, even as uh, Brother Joshua would come and lead us in our first hymn. All right, good morning, everybody. So the lyrics will be on the screen. May I invite everyone to stand up as we sing the first hymn, Bow the Knee. Our scripture reading this morning, open your Bibles to Psalm 8. And the next hymn that we will be singing is actually taken from this psalm. So in preparation, let's uh, read this psalm together. Psalm 8, we will read it responsively. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the adventure. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you with our whole hearts. 
we recount all your wonderful deeds. We are glad and we exult in you. And we sing praise to your name, O Most High. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you reign over all things and over all situations. We are thankful that because you are God, we can bow the knee. In fact, we must bow our knee because there is none else in heaven and earth and on earth that we can worship except you and you alone. Father, you have shown us repeatedly that every el- everything else, everyone else, pale, pales in comparison to you. You have taught us that our hope ought to be in no one except in you and you alone. Everyone else disappoints. Everyone else fails because all of us are mere creatures of yours. Sinful creatures, fallen creatures, imperfect creatures. And only you and you alone will never fail. That is why only you and you alone do we put our trust in. O oh Lord, we pray this morning that you will help our hearts to stay on you. Perhaps we bring in all kinds of sorrows and worries and anxieties and despair. And our minds are fraught with cares And it is hard for us to come here this morning to focus on you. We may be angry, bitter, worried, concerned, depressed. But, oh Lord, what a joy it is to know that our God sits enthroned in heaven. He is our shield. He is our refuge. And He's in control. And Father, so often, because we desire to be on the throne and we desire control, we are disappointed and we are in despair. (laughs) Because things didn't turn out the way we expect them to. And Father, I pray this morning that as we put our hearts and our focus on you, that through the life of this man, Ron Hamilton, whom you have used in such a mighty way, this entire life wholly given unto you, to do the work that you have given him to do through the ministry of music. So many individuals' lives have been touched. In fact, many children's lives turned to you because of his ministry in music. We are thankful that this man in fact, his, he and his family, he and his wife, through great adversity, great, great adversity, they have continued to focus on you and really living out what their purpose in their hearts to do, which is to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord, And Father, you have put 
so many trials along their ways, really for them to put to practice what they have been preaching, and they have done so well. And this morning, we are thankful that this child of yours, his race has ended, but it has been a well-run race. Oh Lord, we rejoice in the faithfulness of this man. That even, th- go, even though going through dementia, he endured it with grace and actually great rejoicing. He was not angry, he was not grumpy, he was always smiling, always laughing, even though his mind gradually ceased to work. Yet, he continues to rejoice. What a remarkable work of your spirit in this man's life. We only wish that in our soundness of mind, we will be half like what he was in his dementia state. But we thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you have done and how your Spirit has empowered this man to be such a wonderful testimony for you. And so this man, Ron Hamilton, has been an inspiration to us and words would fail to do us justice in the way we would honour him today. We pray that for the rest of us here, whose race have not ended, that you would help us to run the race well and to finish well, like good old Patch the Pirate. We ask all this in your son's most precious name. Amen. All right, for our next hymn, the words will also be once again on the screen. Uh, I'll have everyone sit down for this next hymn, uh, How Majestic is Thy Name. Oh, 
you for your wonderful singing. Thank you, Brother Joshua, for leading us with a beautiful song this morning. For this morning, I would like to just turn to Psalm 150, looking at the life of this dear brother Hamilton, how despite of all the adversity, he truly have lived up what Psalms 150 says. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe every one of us has breath this morning. And therefore we must praise the Lord. Even with the late brother Ron, Ron Hamilton, he's still praising the Lord. This means there's no end to praising the Lord. And this morning, we also have the privilege of Noah, who is using some form of a trumpet. French horn. Yeah, it's a French horn. But just in case you don't know a French horn, it's something like a, sounds like a trumpet, I guess. But it's a French horn. So... Without much further ado, we want to thank you, um, and we'll let Noah, you know, does his French horn. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Of all the brass instruments, all right, the French horn is actually one of the most challenging uh, instruments to play. Uh, if you were to, okay, so you see how the pipes are all curled up like that? If you were to unwind the pipe and lay it from end to end, all right, that instrument is 30 meters long, all right? and try blowing that long a pipe through a mouthpiece that is different from all the other brass instrument mouthpiece, which is usually, you know, in a concave um, uh, shape. This one is like that, all right? So it's, uh, it's, and, you know, often it's played sitting down, but when you, and then how you place your hand in there and all that makes a lot of difference in terms of tuning and all that. So uh, well done, uh, um, Noah. If you ask Ron Hamilton what fuels him through the various trials that the Lord has brought him through, you can say, well, you know, he has such a, he's such a good character, 
you know, strong person and all that. Uh, I think what he will tell you is that through the difficult times, and he has gone through many difficult times, as I mentioned in my introduction earlier on, there really is his dependence upon the Lord that has seen him through. And I think the lesson that we learn from Pastor Pirate is that he has really exemplified the dependence on the Lord and uh, casting his care upon him, trusting in him. And that has actually kept him going. The Lord has actually kept him going. The Lord has kept him rejoicing. His Holy Spirit is at work in this man's life. And that's what's energizing him. And I think a song that maybe we are all very familiar with is the song, Lord, I Need You. I do not know if you are going through a difficult time right now, but perhaps this is a wonderful reminder that uh, we all need the Lord. So at this time, my family will come.
All right, we will have our final hymn before uh, the message. So the children will be dismissed after the first stanza, and once again, the lyrics will be on the screen. May I invite everyone to stand for this one? Uh, Rejoice in the Lord. share kind of like a, an anecdote about uh, Ron Hamilton. Both he and I actually had the same voice teacher at Bob Jones, Dr. Gilgary. He's with the Lord in heaven. If he's around, he would be in his mid-90s, I think, but uh, he has passed away. Uh, Ron Hamilton was a, back in the day, they call it sacred music min, uh, major. They call it church music nowadays. So uh, actually, his primary instrument was trombone. He was a trombone uh, sacred music major. And um, he decided to take uh, some voice lessons with my voice teacher, Gail Gingery. And um, one day, doing my voice lesson with Dr. Gingery, uh, he said, he was telling some stories about Ron Hamilton, and he said when he first came to Dr. Gingry for a voice lesson, he would sing phrases without breathing. You know, usually we would, we, would, we, would, we would sing a phrase, and then we would breathe, we would sing another phrase, and we would breathe, and all that. And uh, Dr. Gingry said, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
Ron, you are not breathing between the stanzas. Uh, uh, you know, between, uh, uh, you're not breathing, you know, between these different phrases. And actually, what it actually is, is uh, Ron Hamilton runs marathons. And his lung capacity was so incredibly huge, he did not have to breathe between stanzas that normal people have to, uh, between phrases that normal people have to do. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, he had a job, Dr. Kimi said to me, off campus, you know, and he would actually run to his workplace off campus and run back. You know, in the States, if you, if you don't have a vehicle, and he didn't have a vehicle back then, uh, it, it's hard to get anywhere. Well, he didn't need a vehicle because he just ran everywhere he went. And on Shirley Hamilton's post um, this last week, you know, she knew that Ron is going to be going to heaven soon. And uh, she mentioned things like, you know, actually, he is, he is, he is actually, everything's gone, but he was still breathing, as if he did not know how to stop. Well, we can, I can, when, when she wrote that, I, I, I say I understand why. Because uh, he was just such a sportsman, you know, he had so much energy, he had so much breath and all that in him, that really that was the last organ, it seems, to fail. Uh, because of, um, of the immense capacity in his lungs. And, uh, and then when finally that gave out um, on Wednesday night, uh, Greenville time, uh, the Lord took him home. So it's a life well lived. Would you turn your Bibles back to 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We are going into this new chapter, next chapter here, and actually uh, we will probably end this next week. Uh, we will take the first five verses today and then uh, verses 6 uh, through 15, uh, this uh, next Lord's Day, and then we'll be done with uh, these, this particular section of uh, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read the first five verses of chapter 9. And then uh, we'll open with the introduction. St. Corinthians 9 verse 1, Paul says, Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia, Achaia referring to Corinth, Corinth is in the region of Achaia, saying that Achaia, you all, has been ready since last year, all right, to take up this collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers, and who are the brothers? Well, these are the ones that we looked at last week, right? You know, there was, it was Titus, and then, you know, there are these other two brothers that were not named. So that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians came, come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. This morning, we are going to see, and really, this is the point that we are going to make here in these five verses, Paul's transparent communication regarding giving. Transparent communication regarding giving. Now, you have observed probably uh, as you in communication and so on that in our communication with people the level of transparency and honest conversation that we have uh, shows the level of closeness we have with them it is probably less likely that we'll be upfront and open with a stranger we just met, met five minutes ago you know telling them our whole life story and all that uh, but with a best friend whom we have known for decades we can be willing, we can be open and transparent about almost everything. Our guards are down, 
Um, you know, we can really be ourselves. We don't have to be guarded about what we say. You know, if I say this, will I offend him? If I say that, will I, will I offend him? No. I trust you have that kind of friend in your life that you can be open about everything. But, you know, that is the nature of Paul's communication with the Corinthian believers. Some of what he tells them almost sounds too honest and frank. I'm not sure when you go through this, you realize some of what he said. Uh, should we really be saying it like that? We kind of know, but uh, not so convenient to say, but he was very frank. Almost too honest. But Paul has been that way throughout the entire book of 2 Corinthians. In fact, remember back in chapter 6, verse 11, he says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. He's not just giving lip service to that. He is really meaning what he says. He's actually demonstrating that that is the case. He is being very open and openly and free to them. So even in a topic that is inconvenient to speak about, where his reputation is almost at stake if he was misunderstood, Paul attempts to be open. He feels free to communicate some concerns he has about the collection. Now, if you remove the chapter division, right? You, you don't have chapter 9, verse 1. Actually, Paul continues the discussion that we began last week about, you know, he, he talked about Titus and then the brother that was uh, famous for preaching the gospel, the other brother uh, uh, that was uh, often tested and proven to be zealous, earnest. And once again, here in this passage this morning, Paul very tactfully says that it is superfluous, really not necessary to write about this. Look at verse 1. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. It is actually not necessary for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints, but he continues to write to them about this ministry for the saints, the collection. Okay, have you heard people like that? You know, not to change the subject, but, and then they go on to change the subject. You know? Okay, there is actually, I found this week, eh? it's actually a kind of rhetorical device. All right? The technical term is paralepsis. Paralepsis is the Greek word to mean passing over. Yeah, I made a qualification, but I just passed over it. You know, I, I, you know I, I don't mean to change the subject, but I'm going to change the subject anyways. And I think... There are two purposes as to why people do that. First of all, it is to acknowledge that people may not want what is coming up next, you know, they may not be so ready to discuss what's coming up next, but also it is to prepare them for what is to come, right? Not to change the subject, but, okay, it's preparing the listener for the change of subject, right? Right? That is the purpose. So here, Paul is employing this rhetorical device, and maybe perhaps he's going to say more than what he actually says here in these two chapters. But in any case, we know that he, whatever he says or doesn't say is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has exactly the words that we, 2,000 years later, need to hear about this particular topic. All right? So, um, what are some of the concerns that the Apostle Paul was willing to communicate transparently to the believers? Okay, look at in verses 2 and 3. He says, For I know your readiness, and the word can be translated as willingness, for I know your willingness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia, and once again, Achaia refers to the Corinthian church here. Achaia is the region that Corinth is in. Has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Okay, so 
he is concerned, look at here, the first point, he is concerned that his boasting actually be a reality. The fact is, this is not the first time Paul is discussing the topic of collection for the Jerusalem believer. In fact, way back in, chapter, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1-4, to Paul has already outlined the steps they need to take. And here we see that Paul has boasted about the Corinthians' willingness to give. All right? When he wrote to them 1 Corinthians, and he says, okay, when I come to you, please get all this ready. Don't collect when I, when I come. Collect, gradually collect and build up so that when I come, there, there, don't, there, there isn't a need for collection. And the people responded with willingness, readiness. In fact, this word, readiness, up in verse 2, uh, was used the previous three times. Chapter 8, verse 11. You go to chapter 8, verse 11. He says, so finish doing it as well so that your readiness, that's the same word, your willingness in desiring it may be matched by you completing up what, what, what you have. Okay? If you say you're going to be zealous about doing it, show it by action, right? Talk is cheap. And then in verse 12, for if the readiness and the willingness is there, it is acceptable according to what a man has, a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. And then in verse 19, all right, we are still in chapter 8. And not only that, but that he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered to us, uh, ministered by us, for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. That word goodwill is the same Greek word there. So these believers were enthusiastically involved in the project. This can be seen in Paul's boasting of the Corinthians to the people in Macedonia. That's what he says, right? He says in verse 2, your willingness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Archaea has been ready since last year. So, okay, here, the word readiness can mean an exceptional interest in being of service, willingness, and goodwill. Okay, so these people were very much uh, involved, okay, since last year. But here we also see that as Paul boasted about the Macedon uh, uh, Macedonians way back in chapter 8, early in chapter 8, beginning of chapter 8, here he's boasting to the Macedonians about the Corinthians. You see how it works here? He boasted about the Macedonians to the Corinthians. He boasted about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. You see what he's doing there? Last week, we saw that he boasted about the Corinthians to the brothers sent to facilitate the collection. Once again, all right, I mentioned this last week. I'm going to mention it again. Paul says good things about other people behind their backs. We all know that very often when people talk behind others' backs, it is negative things that we will never feel comfortable about talking about in front of them. So we do it behind their backs. Uh, remember in recent news, uh, this leak, massive leak about the US intelligence, right? And there were information that were embarrassing to the US because they have said some things not so flattering about who? About their allies. Ooh. And it was leaked out, right? You know, I think it goes to show, okay, you can talk about, you know, well, you know, how can they keep the secret properly and all that? They, they let this low-ranking airman, you know, uh, you know uh, have access to top secret documents and all that. Okay, never mind. I think eventually, it goes to show that what you say about someone eventually will be known. There's this saying, right? The walls have ears. Be careful what you say. All right? In a room, when two person knows it, it is no longer a secret. 
All right? And I think a lot of people in the US intelligence community knows, knows about, about it. But, and here's what the Lord has convicted me this last week as I was studying this, as I was thinking, meditating about this. What if we purpose to make it a habit to say only good things about other people behind their backs? Now, you say, but what about legitimate concerns? Go to them directly to address some concerns that you have about them rather than sharing it with people who, first of all, may not be able to do anything about it, okay? But it creates an atmosphere sometimes lead, leading to bitterness. Sometimes what, what we call secondhand bitterness, okay? You, you, you have some issue with this person, right? Instead of addressing with this person, you're going to tell another person. And now you are mad at this person, but this, now this other person is mad at this person too. It's like, how oh, can he do this to you? <laughs> The honourable and the scriptural thing to do is to go to that person. The Bible has a lot to say about gossip. Gossip is spreading negative information about other people to someone who cannot do anything about it. All right? Negative news about others has a way of attracting our ears. We call this juicy news. Oh, tell me, what, 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 do, what do you know about this person? All right, Proverbs 18, 8 verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 8 says, The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. Tell me, tell me, tell me, what's the latest gossip? Well, let me read to you a couple of verses in Proverbs 11, verse 13. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Proverbs 20, 20 verse 19, Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a simple babbler. It is a form of slander. In fact, in the, towards the end of this book, Paul says, For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, Perhaps they may be quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostility and slander and gossip and conceit and disorder. All this are sins that Paul fear may be present in this church. And really, it is something that busybody, you know, they have, they have too much free time, you know, it's like, just trying to find out what, what is going on in other people's life. 1 Timothy 5.13 says, Beside that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. Too much free time, right? It is good for you to be busy. You have no time to be a busybody. Oh, wait. If you are a busy body, you have no time to be a busybody. How's that? And then 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 11, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. And you know, you know the kind of, you, you gather as a group and you start complaining, right? The church shouldn't be doing it. What kind of an atmosphere does that create in that whole group now? You ask yourself, is that, have you begun to edify other people? It makes people feel discontented. It makes them with this real critical attitude in their hearts. And, and it destroys. There is great destruction. Which is why Paul James says that, you know, the tongue is a small thing, but it can cause worldwide devastation, all right? Look at what is happening online with social media. 
It is amazing the kind of thing people say online. It's just amazing. People not following what scripture says about our speech. It can be a world of destruction. So, what is the remedy that the, that the scripture gives to us is Titus 3 2. To speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy to all toward all people. Now, you say, but what about what if there is a genuine concern? Yes. We are uh, Paul, when he tells this to Titus, he's not saying you sweep everything under the rug, okay? Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? No. If there is genuine concern, like I mentioned earlier, you go to the brother, you go to the sister, and, okay, so you need wisdom. You need to pray about this, all right? If this is really bothering you, someone has done something, really bothers you, you have to, you have to give a lot of consideration, right, to, 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 to how you want to approach this thing, all right? You can just blurt it out to any, the whole world and all that, you know, about, about your discontent, all right? But if you find that okay, I, I'm just not close enough with this person to, to, to go to him. If, if I say this to him, he sure get offended, you know. He will, you know, slap me upside down, you know, and then slap at me and you know, all that kind of thing. Okay, fine. Is there someone who is close to this person, you know, that can help you with this? Maybe the, the, the two of you go together to this particular brother or sister. All right, perhaps the pastor or perhaps one of the church leaders and all that can, can assist in this, because when I hear something from someone, you know, I, I, I am not an investigator. I don't go around, you know, what are you doing today? Uh? You know, is there something I should know? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that kind of thing. But inevitably, sometimes people will tell me things. And when I hear something, okay, now I decide, should I do something about it? Right? There is a reason God wants me to know certain things, and I'm not going probing and asking people, you know, calling people, you know, what are you doing uh, that I should know? I'm not doing that. But so, sometimes people let me know something. I have to now decide, okay, should I do something about it? Or should I let it pass? And if we do, should do something about it, then let's, let's move on with, uh, to do something about it. So we are not saying, all right, that you never ever talk about it, but whoever talk, you talk to must be able to then take some follow-up action to remedy the situation in dependence upon God. So that's why, you know, Paul says in Ephesians 4, 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you among, along with all malice. First Peter 3, uh, 2, 1, put away all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Put it all away. Okay? Uh, and, you know, let's be busy for the Lord. And if there's something to say about other people behind their backs, be like Paul. Say the good things about them. All right? Because eventually, if you, if, if, if you say certain things to certain people about the other person that is negative, it has a way of getting to the person. It has a way of getting to the person. Okay? I'll just leave it there to go on to the next point. All right? Which is... All right, you see there, Paul says that because I boasted about you to the Macedonians, look at the effect of that. Look at the effect. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. Your zeal. The wonderful effect of Paul's boasting about the Corinthians to the Macedonians is that their zeal is stirred up. Okay, you may want to call this positive peer pressure or whatever, but the word stirred up is a neutral word here. In fact, in Colossians 3.21, it is translated as provoke, as in fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Do not stir up your children in a negative way lest they become discouraged. All right, but I think some of you are thinking about another verse. What verse are you thinking about? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Hebrews 10.24, right? Stir up one another to love and good works. This is not the same word. It is a synonym of this word. But that is exactly what Paul is doing. He is sharing about what the messengers are boasting about them. He's boasting about the Corinthians. So that good works can be stirred up. Love can be stirred up. That is what Paul is attempting to do. 
and perhaps in bringing up the example of the Macedonians, that has also stirred up the Corinthians as well. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. Paul's boasting of the Corinthians has the effect of stirring up most of the Macedonians. All right? But you notice there, I, 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 have you noticed this? A, a small little phrase there. And your zeal has stirred up, how many of them? I think that's very good already. Most of them, you know. Wow. As a church leader, I know it's not important to, not impo- it's not possible to stir up everybody, all right? Uh, but if you can stir up a lot of people, most of them, that is very good already. You know how it is, right? You know, when you want to do something, uh, one third of people will be for you. They say, let's go, let's go. Another, another third will be ambivalent, all right? So neither good or you know, neutral. Another third will be, no, no, never, 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 all right? So actually, most of them is very good already. Um, and, you know, so bringing up the life story of Ron Hamilton, and perhaps, you know, a biography of him will be written by his wife someday, uh, has a way of stirring us up to love and good works. Has a way of inspiring us as we go through our own sufferings. You know, how do we respond? And, and, it, and, and apparently it is possible to respond in a way that really pleases the Lord. Right? So, you know, reading good biographies or past Christian, you know, can en- enable you, you know, to be in- in somewhat inspired. It's like, oh, man, look at how difficult this individual's life is. I'm not even going through that much of a difficulty. You know, it really puts everything in perspective, right? Perspective. Now, look at verse 4. Before we go next, uh, verse 4. He is now giving another concern. He says, otherwise... If some Macedonians come with me and find that you're not ready, we would be humiliated. You know? And this is why we say, Paul doesn't sound like a very spiritual reason to get the people to give. You say that they are going to lose, you, will, you will lose face, you know. You know, because I boast about you all to these Macedonians, then I bring them, then they see that you're like, a bit, you know, like, you know, not very interested in giving like that. I paise, you know. That's why, you know, if we have a Singlish translation, uh, uh, Singlish Standard Version, SSV, okay? Not King James, wow, uh, jalat. But that's what he's saying. And we say, oh, this kind of thing shouldn't say. Isn't that pride? You know, we say, wow, well, you want to have face and all that in front of people. It's like having pride, right? Didn't Paul say he is very transparent and honest in his sharing? Nothing is hidden. You know, he's like not very guarded, uh, a bit vulnerable because saying things like this would attract, you know, attacks from our people. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more. You know, you know what Paul is concerned? You know how you say a lot of good things about other people? And it becomes not real, not, not, actually not real, you know? What, what, there's a word for it. What do I call it? You're flattering someone. Right? And Paul is concerned that his boasting about the Corinthians not turn into some kind of flattery where he, well, he just... It says all kinds of exaggerated good things about them until it becomes, you know, real or not. He doesn't want what is said about them to come up empty. He has communicated the willingness, the eagerness of the Corinthians to help in the collection. So he has already, has a, there's a kind of expectation set in the other people's minds, right? No. In discipleship, the challenge and difficulty sometimes is to help the people they are discipling to grow and to excel in their responsibilities. Perhaps you have an initiative and you're excited about it, you know, like, like Paul, right? He has this initiative to make this collection. Wow, he wrote to everybody about it and all that. You know, how do you get others excited about this cause? You, you feel very sure this is what God wants you to do, and everybody's like, about it. 
right? Seems like you're always getting mixed responses. Some say, yeah, 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 let's go, let's go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the willing eagerness one. Then some like, oh, okay, you know, can also, don't, don't also can and all that. Then some say, no, absolutely not, you know, they're eagerly uh, against you. Uh, and I think there is a sense in which this is what's going on here, uh, which is why I mentioned earlier on, you know, it's very good that most of the Macedonians were stirred up to do this. And it is actually easier for someone like the Apostle Paul to live up to a certain expectation. I mean, we say, well, if I can be half of what Apostle Paul is like, I'll be very, very happy, right? I'll be very contented. All right? It is someone like Apostle, it is one thing for someone like Apostle Paul to live up to these expectations than for other people to live up to that kind of a standard. So that is, I think, what is going on here. And, you know, some, some people say, eh, if I've done well, I'll do it myself. I delegate to other people, you know, then they, you know, well, I think that, that goes to speak about, you know, living up to a certain, certain expectation and so on and the difficulty that, that entails there. And, you know, once again, the discipler and the person being disciple, you know, can err in different responses. Not easy, really not easy. Okay? Uh, and sometimes, you know, they meet the standards and sometimes they don't and all that. And, you know, uh, it can be easier for you to do it yourself than to do, ask people to do, other people to do it and all that. But once again, you know, if you say, ah, all these people I ask to do, can I make it and all that, I do it myself. Then what you really will be doing, you're really short circuiting the discipleship process that God desires for us to have. And then if you're going to do it yourself, the ministry doesn't grow. The church doesn't grow. Okay? Because you can only do so much. All right? So we have to all begin to delegate. And I think that, that, that really is the way to go. Um, uh, and to get others involved in, in the ministry. So let's, let's, let's talk about a little bit. But what about this concern for potential humiliation, right? Paul says, you know, if you find that you're not ready, we'll be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident about your willingness to give. So Paul plans to bring some believers from the churches in Macedonia with him to Corinth. And if they, are, if they are not ready, like how he said that they will be ready, then both Paul and the Corinthians would be humiliated. They both would lose honour if they don't live up to what Paul has already said about them. It makes Paul look, look bad because he is saying something that is not real. Not true. It makes them look bad, okay, because it shows that they may be unloving. Because, you know, if giving is part of the zeal, maybe it seems like they are unloving. And their supposed zeal has already stirred up the Macedonians. So what a shame it would be if Paul says later on, if I bring some Macedonians with me and then show that, see that you are actually very, you know, not very enthusiastic. Wow. What a shame it will be. And the whole project would be jeopardized if the Corinthians falter in their commitment. You know, you say, well, why would Paul motivate them by giving appeal to their pride, potential loss of face, humiliation? Well, in Paul's defense, he does not merely use this line of reasoning to motivate them to give. He used the example of the Macedonians. He even uses the example of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave the ultimate sacrifice. So Paul is using multiple lines of reasoning to motivate giving. In this case, he's appealing to their pride, okay? Now, you may be thinking, wow, we are in the second chapter now regarding giving, Paul seems to be going on and on and on about it. He says, you know, it's superfluous for me to write about you, but he continues, right? Why is this such a big deal to Paul? This collection, right? Why just keep going on and on and on about it? Okay. For the Apostle Paul, the testimony of Christ is at stake. Paul said earlier on, 
in chapter 8, verse 8. Uh, you look at chapter 8, verse 8. He says, This collection is to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. And our Lord taught in John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also love one another. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. And one tangible act of love is through the giving and meeting of needs that these poor believers have. It is love in action. It's not just saying only, right? Oh, I love you, I love you, but then, you know, oh, you have need, uh, I'll pray for you. <laughs> but specifically, it is, it, it is who loving who? It is the Gentile churches loving the Jewish believers. You see, many of the Jewish, many members of the Jewish church view Paul's mission to the Gentiles with suspicion. All right? He would, he would write about it in, in, in Romans 9, 10, and 11. All right? He will write about it. He will, he, he will assure them, look, my desire is that my people would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. The people felt that he's kind of abandoning him. You are a Jew. Why aren't you ministering to the Jewish people? Why are you going to the Gentiles here and there and all that? He says, no. I desire that you all be saved. So they, they, they have a kind of suspicion. It's like, oh, why are you going out to all these Gentile people? <coughs> Yet the finished work of Christ on the cross, okay, if you remember Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, creating in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, one new man instead of two. So making peace and reconciling us both Jews and Gentiles to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Okay, that is the theological reality that Paul is describing. And here, he is giving the practical reality of that theological reality. That is theological. When Christ is on the cross, no more separation between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. All come together. One man. No more hostility. Okay. How do you show that, practically speaking? In this case, through the meeting of needs of these Jewish believers. You see what Paul is doing here? You see why the stakes are high for the Apostle Paul? Okay? And then finally, he is concerned to send the brothers on ahead. He says in verse uh, 5, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Okay, let's just break it down. He, he ends with reasons why he's sending the brothers on ahead. All right, he's not going yet. He, they are, they're going to like, you know, advance party. So, first of all, it is because they've already promised to give. Verse 5, okay? You have promised, right in the middle of verse 5. They have already promised the gift. In other words, they have already pledged that they would give towards this need. And they do not want to be seen as going back on their words, do they? If they have given their words, they should keep their words. It's not a good testimony to say one thing, do another. We should mean what we say, say what we mean. All right? <clears throat> not just make all kinds of promises and all that, then never ever do anything. It's much easier to talk than to actually do, Right? It's, it's more sweat and, 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 and tears and blood involved in the doing. The giving, the, the talking, yeah, anybody can talk. You know, there's no problem. But actually, okay, if you have an ESV, do you see a footnote next to the word gift? Okay, I have a footnote number four there, and I go down to number four, and what is the word? What is the Greek word there? Do you have a footnote? You can, you can talk to me, talk to me. What's the word that you see there? Blessing. 
the word behind the word gift is the word blessing. That's helpful. In other words, it's not just a mere matter of avoiding shame and humiliation that they should give. Rather, Paul wants them to know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word for blessing. If you don't have it, you can write it down. It occurs twice. You can literally say it. I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance for the blessing you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing blessing. And, okay, if you go back to 1 Corinthians, there are some hints that the Corinthian church may have some struggles with covetousness and greed. He says in 1 Corinthians verse, chapter 4, verse 7, what do you have that you did not receive? If you have received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And it's natural for us to consider receiving a gift as a blessing rather than giving. All right? Because receiving is gaining. Giving is losing. Who wants to lose, right? But once again, if we view giving the way our Lord has taught it, that it is more blessed to give than to receive, it is then really, when we can give, it really is a supernatural ability from God. It is understanding that God has blessed us. We talked about this, right? You know, several weeks ago, that God has blessed us over and above our expectations, and that since everything belongs to Him, that we can give. And that giving is evidence that we have been blessed by God. It is done out of thanksgiving to the Lord. Giving is an act of grace. Okay, and then, look at the last phrase there. Not as an exaction. So that when we come, you can give the gift as you promise. It is a blessing. You give it willingly. The last phrase there, not as an exaction. You see another footnote there, footnote 5. You go down to footnote 5, what do you read? What do you read? You can, you can, you can talk to me. Or a gift expecting something in return. Is that helpful? Is that helpful to know? It's like, hey, be fair, lah. You know, I give you, you must give me back. But what if certain people that you give to will never be able to repay you? And once in a while, you know, when back in the day when I was alone in church and all that, I'll be sitting here. Once in a while, there'll be someone coming into the church. You know, you take out a letter, and, and you know, it, it is some kind of documentation. It is a hospital bill. It is something. In other words, they need money. They need money. And every single... So, I'll say, okay, here, here's, let's say, $20 or whatever. You can have it. And you know, every single one of them, you know what they tell me? I'll return to you someday. And do you know absolutely what never ever happens? They never ever give back. When you give, you, it, I have your IC number, telephone number, email address, fax number, and all that. You don't return to me by this day. I'm going to call you, you know, hang pig head on your, on, your, on your house and all that. No. I, I tell these people, here's the money. Take and go. You give, don't expect anything in return. And in, in this case, uh, the Corinthians' willingness to give is a testimony of their love. You know, so that it may be a willing gift of blessing, not as an exaction. And that word exaction there in the Greek means greediness, covetousness. It, it, it refers to a desire to have more than one's due. And so this footnote here, a gift expecting something in return, these certainly are hindrances to generosity, isn't it? And sometimes, you know, someone gives to us and then out of pride, we say, okay, I need to return you the favor. You know, I cannot, because in my mind, you know, I've owed, I, I, I'm, I'm owning you, owing you a, a debt. So I need to return it to you. In fact, it's very interesting. Okay, this is a noun. Paul uses the verb form of this, of this word in chapter 2, verse 11. In this way, I'll read to you. He says, so that we will not be outwitted by Satan. That is the same word there uh, in the verb form. 
for we are not ignorant of his designs, so that we will not be outwitted by sin. In other words, we will not be tricked by him, taken advantage of by, by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. It is also used in chapter 7, verse 2. Make room in your heart for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have, and here's the word now, taken advantage of no one. And and what Paul is saying also is he's trying to avoid a a potential pitfall in his effort to collect the love gift that he is somehow trying to exploit them or take advantage of them, outwit them, tricking them to give. One commentator translates the word exaction as money wrung out of you. How can I get you to give as much as possible? Well, so you guilt people to give. There's guilt. You give out guilt rather than gladness. That's not giving out of love. Garland, in his commentary, says that generous giving only comes when it is voluntary, it is not coerced. Right? So, here you can see that Paul is seeking to protect not just his own reputation, but also the reputation of the Corinthians in the right way. Can you see that? He says, hey, I'm just telling you all these things so that when the time it comes that, you know, what I say about you is truly, is really true, not some kind of flattery that is not reality. Uh, so, once again, we are not talking about wrongfully protecting someone who has sinned. In this case, that is totally a different situation. He has described them in the best possible light, and he does not think that they are somehow incapable of living up to his positive description of them. Why? Because God's grace is at work in them. Remember the word grace, a curse, so many times, ten times in these two uh, chapters. And while Paul is confident of the Lord's work in the Corinthians' lives, he does not sit idly by. He proact- he's, he's, he's like a coach, you know. He's like a, like a cheerleader. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. You know, that kind of thing. He's communicating transparently with his people so that they can see the implications when this work is not done exactly, you know, done the way it should. All right? Now, let me just end with this. Open communication is risky. And I think you have seen some of what Paul says here is open to criticism. It makes you vulnerable and puts you at a risk of being misunderstood. And I think that's why we don't do it. You know, just, let's just keep quiet about it. But Paul, who is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what he wrote, gave everything God wants us to know here. So, with that, these are these three questions. How then can we foster this kind of honest conversation among brothers and sisters in Christ? And I think the first thing we have to say is that it, it has to begin with us, right? You expect it out of other people, you have, to, you have to kind of model it yourself. All right. Uh, secondly, in what ways can gossip be destructive? And here, I'm kind of narrowing it down to the life of the local church. All right, when we start to say things about people or whatever, whatever, what kind of, what, how, how does that, you know, how, 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 how can it destroy? And number three, how can we seek to protect the reputation of other believers? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that even in a passage that communicates uh, administrative instructions and one that probably communicates concerns and fears, that there is much we can learn and apply in our lives regarding our own speech. Sometimes we say what we shouldn't say and we don't say what we ought to say. But such is the fallen nature of our tongue. And Father, I pray that you would forgive me even as 
studying this passage, there are so often I failed in this regard. And I pray that you will help me to use my tongue in a better way. I pray that you will help all of us to communicate in a way that would edify others, that we bring certain things to those who need to know and who will do something about it, but often we just need to go to that particular brother or sister and tell him what he needs to know as what Matthew 18 has said. And Father, sometimes we don't realize the implication, the destructive implications of our tongue. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be like the Apostle Paul, to communicate good about other people behind their backs. And that requires a transformation of our mind. Sometimes we are just so fraught with negative and critical thoughts. And we think about how you are towards your children. That as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from you. You do not bring up these faults again. Oh Lord, help us, because we are so far from being like you. I know I am. But we are thankful you have promised your grace to us to be able to change, become more like your son. And so we ask all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. Let's close with a final hymn. How can I fear? You know, Paul has his concerns too, which he communicates to the believers in Corinth. We have our concerns as well. We have our fears. What are your fears today? If I can give you, if I let you give a testimony here, I think... Uh, we will go for the rest of the day. It is countless. But what will happen when we fear? Well, we will let Brother Ron help us transform our minds regarding our fears. Let's stand together and sing this hymn. Oh, uh-huh.
Amen. May that be the testimony of our hearts. Thank you. Be seated.